Welcome everybody, I'd like to have your attention. <clears throat> Welcome to the resumption of our senior speaker series and to the middle of winter term. I'm very happy for our skiers and snowboarders that some snow is here. Uh, as you know, midterm grades close this Friday and next week we will have an extended weekend from February 2nd to the 6th. Uh, today we will hear from eight seniors starting with Kyle and ending with Sophie. After Sophie speaks, I have a few thoughts to share before we depart for G period. Kyle. Hello. My name is Kyle Dunn, and I'm a PG from South Windsor, Connecticut. Most people come up here for their chapel speech and talk about important moments in their life that shape them as a person, and I'm no exception. Since I have you all in front of me now, I don't think there's a better time to share my life-altering experience. I remember the day like it was yesterday. I was swimming in the water off the coast of Mexico. The sun was shining. It was looking like the perfect day. As I splashed in the water, an unsettling feeling crept into my body. Then, suddenly, the water next to me erupted, and I was looking a shark right in the eyes. My first reaction was, was to panic and began flapping my arms to try to defend myself. As all hope left my body, it was like my guardian angel came to my rescue. Out of nowhere, a man came to my aid and punched the shark right between the eyes. Still in shock, I started rushing back to the shore. I swear, at that moment, I swam faster than Michael Phelps and found myself clutching the sand on the beach. The shock of what had just happened began to wear off, and I remembered my savior was still in the water. I turned to face the ocean and saw the man calmly swimming back to the beach. Left in awe at what just happened, I eagerly waited to thank the man that had just saved my life. However, in a flash, all my fear transformed into awe, as the man who had just saved me was no other than the legendary Michael Jordan. <laughs> my jaw dropped. I couldn't believe what that the man who had just saved my life was an NBA superstar. At the same time, my family rushed over to see what had gone down in the water. Once they got closer, they also couldn't believe who I was standing next to. They began, they began flooding me with questions about what had just happened, and Mike just casually stood there. <laughs> Boom! All of our attention shifted to the dark cloud that had suddenly brewed in the sky. The weather had flipped in a heartbeat, and the once bright sun was consumed by clouds. Rain began to fall. <laughs> Rain began to fall from the sky. In the distance, I could see what looked to be a flash hurricane. We all ran under the tent close to us to save us from the sudden storm. My natural instincts kicked in, and I knew the scene all too well. Sharks plus a storm can only mean one thing. Sharknado. <laughs> I looked at my family and told them to run, over to the, run away from the beach. I looked at, over at Mike, and he looked at me. We both knew what was happening. Luckily, the sharks wouldn't be able to catch me off guard this time. It was time to get serious. Mike reached into his bag and pulled out his lucky chainsaw. <laughs> Since I never leave the house without my trusty bat, I knew that our power together could take down this wave of sharks. We screamed a mighty war cry and ran towards the onslaught of sharks. Since I'm standing here today, I think you can all assume how the rest of it went. Thank you, Southfield, and I hope you really enjoyed my totally real story. <laughs> sporting events or concerts, our family is always there together. My oldest cousin Ava and I have always been the closest. We're the most similar in age and spent our entire childhood together. Ellie, on the other hand, is the youngest of us, but somehow manages to still be the funniest and the smartest. The memories I have of my cousins are unmatched, and I wouldn't share them for the world. With that being said, growing up in a family with an older sister and two girl cousins, being the only boy isn't always easy. There are many times where I'm faced with a decision with do I hang out with my dad and my uncle, or the cousins who are often doing girl things like shopping? Fortunately for me, over my New Year's break, college football playoffs was intense, meaning I had a great excuse to hang out with the guys. It was over this winter break where I realized how much my cousins really mean to me. 
my family traveled to their house Christmas Day for our typical celebration. And early on, Ava, Ellie, and I escaped the parents in Christmas pictures by playing video games upstairs. Um, this was quickly shut down once Ellie heard that gifts were being opened. As a family, we always start with our secret Santas in which we simply try to get the funniest gifts we can find each other. I can easily say that I found a pretty funny one this year for Ava, at least I thought so, but to spare her the embarrassment, I won't tell you guys what it is. As the celebration went on, we ate, listened to Christmas music, and overall just had a fun time as a family. I did end up getting reeled into making TikToks with Ava and helping Ellie set up all of her new goodies, but it was worth it knowing I wouldn't rather spend my Christmas time with anyone else. The house started to quiet down after our big meal, and after all my dancing for my TikToks, I can say I was pretty tired. Ava, Ellie, and I all hung out in Ellie's room, waiting for the parents to go to sleep. Ellie watched way too much YouTube, staying up way later than she ever has, while Ava and I were still locked into the video games. After about an hour or two, Ava decided to head back to her room and go to sleep. But Ellie, on the other hand, she was far from tired. This is when I was able to convince her that she was a ninja. I was able to, to per persuade Ellie to go downstairs, sneak by her own parents' bedroom, and go steal us some holiday cookies that were in the fridge. And with zero hesitation, she was in on it. I cracked open the bedroom door just enough to see if everyone was asleep. From there, I fully equipped her with all the directions she needed, as I was the watch out for anyone who may have woken up. She lurked into the dark hallway and took her right down the stairs. After what felt like an eternity, she appeared again at the end of the dark hallway, hands full of cookies. She did it. Though, I encouraged her to stay up way later than her typical bedtime and to steal cookies that were supposed to be saved for tomorrow, I couldn't have been more proud of her. We stayed up and ate the cookies until our eyes were too tired to stay open. Me, I got comfy in Ellie's bed, surrounding myself in each and every one of her stuffed animals. Ellie, on the other hand, got demoted from her own bed to the air mattress on the floor, but she didn't seem too upset about it. Even Ellie never failed to put a smile on my face. They motivated me to be a role model and to set a great example for them, as they were only just a few years behind me. There's nobody else I'd rather spend my free time with. Though it may come at the cost of a few shopping trips or funny videos I have to participate in, there's nothing I value more than the relationship I have with my cousins. Thank you. What is it that makes us humans do the things that we do every day? What is it that pushes us to be the best people that we can be? See, this is something that might not come up in every single conversation, but it's something that is important to understand. The answer to this question is this. We have to and need to rely on ourselves enough. Our instincts and our ideas are what gets you to the place that you dream to go. The life you strive to have and is ultimately our navigation system. Relying on your, on your decisions and instincts come in all walks of life. But for me, golf is something that takes this concept to another level. Golf is a game of skill, positive thinking, and instinct. When you get to your ball, you have to decide, okay, how far is it, what club do I hit, and what kind of shot shape do I need to put on the ball to get the closest to the pin as I can. It can be hard to decide. When it comes down to it, it's my instinct that makes the final decision. One time in Scotland, I was playing golf with my brother Davis. On that golf trip, my brother and I found ourselves at the sixth hole of King's Box, the drive will be four. We both walked up to the tee and were ready to unleash. There was some trouble on the right and on the left, but if it didn't catch those areas, you would end up with an eagle look. We knew we could do it, so we pulled out our drivers and bombs away. We both ended up right in front of the green, and the walk from the tee to the ball was one of, yeah, I just did that, as a result of our instinct. In fact, my instinct brought me to Southfield Academy. I went to the same school in North Alworth, Maine, for seven straight years, from, tenth, from fourth grade to tenth grade. It was all I knew. As I entered my sophomore year, I had a change of heart. I knew that in order to follow my passion for playing golf and to develop a broader view of the world, I needed to change schools. After speaking with my, after speaking with my parents, they were 100% on my side, no matter what I chose. After weeks of discussion, I could picture myself as a part of the warm Southfield community. Months after applying, my acceptance letter arrived. It was really happening. 
It was hard to believe that in a year's time, I would be living away from home and attending some field. Sure enough, that year flew by, and on September 8th, I left home to start school. To tell you the truth, at first, it was really hard. Months and months went by, and I was second guessing if I had made the right choice. Adjusting to the new environment and living away from home was difficult, but I knew that I had made the right decision for me and my future. My self the experience has had its challenges, but there have been many people along the way who have supported me. My family gave me room to decide for myself if Suffield was the right place for me. With the guidance from my family and friends, and from people like Mr. Cannon, Mr. Van Dam, Mr. Alatelli, Mr. Bullock, my golf coach Stan, and many more, Suffield has become a place where I can grow as a student, an athlete, and become a stronger person. In golf, I strategize, reflect, and learn by trial and error. In life, I do the same. And for me, this has been really heavy. Having that foundation, that community, on top of your family and friends, has helped me weather these challenges and create the person I am today. As you may know, even after my first year at Suffield, I was changing and adjusting my path. After I repeated my sophomore year in 2021, I made the decision that I wasn't going to do a junior year and decided to jump back into my graduation year of 2023. It's safe to say the five-year plan didn't go according to plan. It might seem like an unusual and added the ordinary path to go on as a high school student, but I like to think of it as being unique, or as Mr. Warren puts it, legendary. Put yourself out there, be different, Follow your instinct, have faith in the uncertain, because whatever you do in life is going to take you on a wild ride. My name is Carson Gall, and I'm a two-year senior from Cumberland, Maine. Thank you. Hi, Sophia. My name is Jason Tom, and I'm a four-year senior from Shanghai, China. Well, that info is quite boring. But you know what is not boring? being a Chinese teaching assistant and working for Mr. Yuan. <laughs> My journey of being a Chinese TA started when Mr. Yuan sent me an email one morning asking if I would like to be his TA. I know, not a very interesting start. And also, sorry Mr. and Mrs. C. I know you wanted me to write a dramatic story of how I need to wake up at 4 a.m. and cook Mr. Yuan a Michelin star level three course meal as his breakfast and clean his shoes and drive him to work. Well, uh, and also, I don't have a driver's license yet. Don't drive without a license, people. Safety first. <laughs> Needless to say, I'm not a very good storyteller, or I'll be in AP Lang or AP Lit instead of just regular English. All right, back to TA. Anyone who ever went to Mr. Yuan's classes knows that his classroom vibe is pretty chill. No assigned seating, unless you're being annoying in class, and no need to turn in your electronics, unless you're having problems. And the first day I walked into the classroom, I saw people eating bagels and sharing hash browns. There are even people lying on the carpet reading from their Chinese textbooks. Although looking relaxed, most Chinese students are pretty passionate about learning Chinese. They will co uh, complete their homework on time, and they, if they have any questions, they will not hesitate to ask Mr. Yuan or me. Mr. Yuan is also very devoted into teaching Chinese. His Chinese class is never dull. He would show his students high-quality Chinese TV shows, videos, and movies, making them do fun projects such as, such as producing a music video, or even taking them on a field trip. Additionally, Mr. Yuan sometimes teaches Chinese history in his class. He also likes to share his stock trading experiences, dreaming of becoming a professional stock trader one day. <laughs> My job in the classroom is to help with pronunciation and writing. Mr. Yuan will also ask me about specific word usage sometimes, or occasionally bring random stuff into the classroom, such as candies tea, noodles, and coffee books. I'm also excited to share my culture with the students. Most Americans are unfamiliar with Chinese culture, which, which creates some misleading facts. My job is to give them the right information. For example, if you're wondering, no, 
Generoso's chicken is not a real Chinese food. You would not find them in China, and most Chinese never heard of it. Um, uh, we never had a famous general whose last name is Tso. Kung Pao chicken, on the other hand, is an actual dish and is pretty well known in China. However, the actual version will be many times spicier than the one you'll pick up from a P.F. Chang's. <laughs> Being Chinese, English is not my primary language. When I was young, I learned English with an American teacher. This experience helped me with my pronunciation and made me much more confident speaking to others when I came to Southfield. I know that learning with a native speaker of that language can help you a lot in your fluency. And this is the reason why I accepted being a Chinese TA without that second thought. Because learning a new language from scratch is not easy. And I want to do my best to help people learn my native language. I also see the value of learning a new language. It's more than just bragging off in front of your friends. Because language is the gateway for you to learn more about a culture you're not familiar with. When one day you encounter someone of that culture, in, let's say, the business world, you will thank yourself for learning their language and their culture. So thank you, Mr. Yuan, for randomly sending me an email that morning. And thank you, Mr. and Mrs. C. You're the best advisors I could ever have for my four years here. And also, Chinese one students, good luck on your test tomorrow. <laughs> and the Chinese for Happy New Year since it's Lunar New Year. Everyone can say it after me. Xin, Xin Nian, Nian, Nian Hua, Hua Lu. Let's do it again, shall we? <laughs> Xin Nian, Xin Nian, Hua, Hua Lu. Everyone got it? Yeah. Great. <laughs> Thank you, everyone, and Happy Lunar New Year. Chongdang, the part of Seoul I am from, is mostly filled with office buildings and tall apartments far from nature. In the spring, I can barely see the clear sky when the bad air pollution arrives. As I graduated from middle school, I wanted to seek opportunities beyond my repetitive urban lifestyle, and I did not want to go through the brutal college process in a Korean high school. Fortunately, my father studied in America at Ohio State when both of my parents came around to the idea of me looking at American boarding schools and also going to college in the United States. While they wanted to raise their only child near them, my consistent complaints about my lifestyle in Korea and hopes of studying abroad were enough to persuade them. When I visited the U.S. to look at Boarding schools, I toured several and applied to schools including Tabor, Mercersburg, Westminster, Canterbury, and obviously Suffolk. A woman my family hired to help us with the school search knew Mr. Ken, and we met in Seoul and met again when I toured in Suffolk. Something resonated with me when I first visited here. It was a feeling I had of comfort and community. When I did revisits after being accepted to the schools, I felt the same way and chose so. I adjusted well in my first and a half year, liking this new experience, and then the world changed and we all started learning remotely from all around the world. As I came back to campus this fall, I was excited to take on a leadership role not all recognized as very meaningful to me. As you know, Sophia values leadership as it is part of our curriculum, and each senior has a role on campus. I have had several, but the one that I think has meant the most to me was being captain of this year's post jv soccer team. In some ways, it was a combination of many years of soccer and leadership for me. We had a great group of guys on the team last year and dedicated coaches in Mr. Van Damme and Mr. Faber. We played our hard schedule against some schools with many more students, but we had a tight bond and many talented players. 
I kept thinking of how Deerfield beat us 6-0 in my first soccer season in Salford. In this year season and the game against them, we lost 1-0, but created many good plays that could have changed the result. It was a great game for all of us and ended a season that I will never forget. My message is there are many different opportunities here to lead and impact others. It can be in the classrooms, in the dorm, on the fields, in the arts, or in the many clubs on campus. The spots you find may not be where you are, where you or others expect. I would like to thank some people as I come to who have helped me during my selfish journey. My parents have generously made this opportunity possible for me and are always loving and supportive. Mr. Ken has been a caring advisor. Mrs. Gobbles helped me a lot on my work with the student newspaper. Mrs. Basha has helped me with the complicated college research. Mr. Roche has been a good listener. And Mrs. Nye has always been there to assist me with my many questions and problems I need to help with. I have enjoyed myself with the experience and am now very relieved in the chapel of So, have a great day. Hi, Southfield. My name is Chloe Coffin. Coffin, for those who know me well. I'm a three year senior from Virginia. After hours of deciding on a chapel speech, I have finally decided to talk about my best friend, Alex. Fun fact, she's watching this right now. Hi, Alex. Okay, and she's the biggest Swifty I know, even more than all of the Taylor obsessed Swifties here. She's been to at least a million of her concerts, and she is the one who introduced me to her songs at about the age of seven. Anyway, I'm not here to talk about her obsession with Taylor Swift. I'm here to talk about my best friend, Alex. Alex and I have been best friends since we were about three. Although we do not have any memories from when we first met, I do know for a fact that we have been best friends since then. Whenever there is drama in my life, Alex is the first one to know. Alex knows about my first heartbreak, my obsession with random TV shows, and my shark obsession. By the time, by the time break comes around and I'm in the car with Alex driving to Target, that's when all the newest drama is filled. For those who don't know, I've been, I've been going to boarding school since fifth grade. At first, I was scared to go because I did not want to leave my family and friends behind, but I went anyway. The person who comforted me the most was Alex. She was with me through all of it. Even though it was just through FaceTime calls. And even though Alex was not physically there with me, she still made me smile when I was down. The thing about Alex is that she is always there for me no matter what, and has been for the past 15 years or so. I love Alex very much, and I do not know what I would do without her. While, my, uh, while I am up here, I wanted to thank some people who have helped me during my time here. Mom, Dad, thank you for everything and helping me when no one else could. Aunt Robin, thank you for giving me every opportunity possible. Mrs. Warren, thank you for being my advisor for three years and helping me through all of my many crises. And thank you to all my friends, you know who you are. Thank you. senior from Boston Mass. Today I'm going to read a card I wrote for my brother's 24th birthday. Josiah, although I can't remember when our friendship progressed away from mutual distaste we maintained throughout a majority of my childhood, I think it's safe to say I'm glad it did. I can't imagine who I'd be without our seemingly endless debates regarding the most recent Marvel production, our late night chats, or our annual adventure to the dentist, which always concludes with us eating Chick-fil-A in your car 30 minutes before we've been instructed to. Bearing this in mind, I don't believe I've ever mentioned how hard it was to adjust to not having a room away as I transitioned from public to private school. Although my first few months here were neither too socially or academically challenging, I constantly found myself riding an overwhelming sense of homesickness, as almost everything I encountered reminded me of it, both you and I. When someone would burst into my room without any announcement, I'd immediately roll my eyes and find myself in my head. While hurriedly going to breakfast for a quick bowl of cereal, I reminisce on all the times we argued, we argued over who contributed more to the empty box of plastic plates, and what the consequences would be for doing so. As I grew annoyed at hearing popular songs ring through classroom halls, I thankfully be reminded of all the times you pranced around my room and performed the most recent lyrics to whatever song you forced yourself to memorize. 
Even now, after attending Southfield for four years, I can still admit it's a rough adjustment being two hours away from you. In spite of how beloved I am to admit it, you are everything I aspire to be and have been for as long as I can remember. Intelligent, funny, sincere, reliable, considerate, and trustworthy are just a few among many of the traits I admire about you. Despite your hesitancy to let most see, I notice the treasure the person you are with me. I cherish the fact that you say the notes are right to you mean or not, in your drawer, and appreciate the talks we have after you come home and wander into my room searching for a conversation. I'm happy to admit that despite having ripped all decorations off your wall, you continue to keep the pole red I forced you to take with me, hung high beside your bed. Although we argue over petty things, such as your horrible sense of style, your weird tendency to post useless information on Instagram, and your inability to admit that I'm funnier than you, I'm proud to say that you're one of my best friends. No matter what I do, I know you're always looking out for me in my best interest, and that I can comfortably turn to you in times of need, except for if I want a late night snack, seeing as you said I remember to get them. Thank you for patiently listening whenever I call you upset and rambling as I struggle to turn my emotions into words. Thank you for pushing me to continue being the best person I can be, and a special thanks for continuing to be my biggest rival in the cross. Lastly, thank you for always being one of my biggest supporters. I wouldn't have it any other way. Happy birthday. I love you always. Thanks. Today, I wanted to talk to all of you about my family. I know many people feel similar to me in the sense that family means everything, so I wanted to take this time to talk about three of my family members that inspire me every day. First, I want to talk about my fraternal twin sister, Ava. She has always been someone who has made me feel comfortable in any stressful situation. From the time we could walk, my father had a lacrosse stick in each of our tiny hands, and since that time, we have played together on countless club, town, and school teams. My dad knew the importance of being part of the team as he played lacrosse at Lafayette College and he wanted us to experience that same sense of community that he felt. Until eighth grade, we navigated the homework and friendships that surrounded us in the same schools. I learned from her that unconditional kindness is the only way to approach life. She has always been one to redirect a hurtful conversation towards a more generous topic. Yet despite that kindness, being her twin meant endless competition and so it was with a feeling of relief that we split up, split up to attend separate boarding schools in ninth grade. Now, when we play against each other, I am less excited for the win than I am for the chance to reconnect with my twin for a few minutes off the field. She has taught me so much throughout our 18 years together. I look up to her every day, and nothing makes me happier than seeing her succeed. The next person I want to share with you is my grandfather, Albert. He is one of the most interesting people I know, and I am proud to share his story. When he was 14 years old, he immigrated to America from Santiago, Chile. We call him Tata, which is a way to say grandpa in many Latin American countries. After high school, he went on to earn his bachelor's degree and medical degree at Boston University through a dual degree program. After being among the top in his class, where he also met my grandmother, who was completing that same program, he graduated in 1971 and went on to receive his board certification in internal medicine in 1976 and neurology in 1977. After this, he went on to become the Emily Fisher Lando Professor of Neurology at Harvard Medical School. The work he has done throughout his career has benefited so many lives, um, and he has written countless articles and books about cognitive neurology, specifically for adults struggling with learning and attention disorders. He served as the Chief of Division of Cognitive Neurology for over 25 years, and throughout that time has done more for others than I knew was even possible. He's done extensive work trying to explain the biological foundations of developmental dyslexia and has been a pioneer in this category in the medical world. He has always taught me to be kind, compassionate, and understanding. Apart from all of his accomplishments in the medical field, he's been nothing short of what a perfect grandfather is. His cabinets were always stocked with our favorite snacks and he paid the closest attention to our likes and dislikes. Traveling to Cambridge, Massachusetts to see him is one of my favorite things to do. He is one of the smartest people I have ever met and even just listening to him talk about our family history or his favorite classical musicians always proves to be interesting. I look up to his determination to pursue his passion in life, and he is a living example that the completion of your goals pays off. Finally, I want to talk about my mom's mother, who is my sis whom my sisters and I call Gammy. She is so important to me, and throughout my childhood, I always looked forward to the nights where I would sleep over at her house. She always had a box of junior mints in her purse, and she always made sure to sneak us a few if we were ever hungry before a meal. We have always been extremely close, which is why it hurt so much when she was di diagnosed with cancer two years ago. 
there was a tumor called a cordoba growing at the base of her skull. This rare bone cancer only affects one in one million people. Considering there have been so few reported cases of this cancer, there is not a lot of information on it. This was scary for my family as we didn't know anything about what my grandma was diagnosed with. After many months of living with the cancer, the tumor grew and somehow struck a nerve in her tongue, paralyzing half of it, making it extremely hard for her to eat and speak. This was extremely scary for everyone, but recently she started a new treatment and the tumor stopped growing. My family and I are extremely hopeful that she will push through, through these, these tough circumstances. Even with this news, she is still the persistent woman we have always known and loved. My grandmother reminds me to be grateful every day for my health, and she shows more resilience than I knew was possible. Her strength has shown me that it is important to be grateful, as well as to be persistent, even when it seems like there's no hope. While I know none of you know these people personally, the lessons they've taught me can apply to all of your lives. From my sister, I have learned unconditional kindness is the only way. From my grandfather, Tata, I have learned how important it is to strive for your goals, even when it seems impossible. And from my Gammy, I have learned how to be resilient, even when times seem dark. Thank you for listening.